The other announcement that I'd like to make is that we are recording the webinar and we will be posting this um, after today on um, the Industry Needs You website. We'll provide that link at the end of the presentation, but um, please feel free to um, share that information with anybody who, if you know that they weren't able to join us here today. Okay, well with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, I wanted to just give an overview of um, what we hope to do today. Um, first, we want to give a brief overview of apprenticeships and the benefits of apprenticeships. I know many of you are involved with apprenticeships or have been learning more about it, but I thought just doing a, a brief primer on the topic would be a good way to start out. Then we'd like to give you an overview of the Greater OPEN Apprenticeship Network grant project. Um, so, you know, at the onset of this five-year project, we wanted to remind everybody of what we said we were going to do within the grant proposal and make sure everybody's on the same page as we get started. We'll also review roles and responsibility and discuss how you can be involved and your organization can be involved. We'll preview some next steps and answer any preliminary questions that you may have. I'll preface this whole thing by saying that um, while we have a project plan in place, there are many details that um, have not yet been worked out or that will be shaping as we organize the governance structure and uh, you know, have opportunity to meet with all of you as partners. Um, so we'll answer what questions we may be able to today and then take others under advisement as we shape the project moving forward. So um, this slide is provided to us by the Department of Labor and I think gives a good overview of the five core components of registered apprenticeship. Obviously, we know at the foundational level that employer involvement is integral. Um, employers must be at the heart of registered apprenticeships. And in fact, you can't have a registered apprenticeship without an employer. Um, in this case, this project is focused exclusively on manufacturers as the employers. Registered apprenticeships include structured on-the-job training with mentoring. Um, we know that that hands-on learning is so very important, but it's coupled with job-related education, so classroom training, instruction, um, so that students are able to, or apprenticeship, apprentices are able to apply their um, lessons that they learn in the classroom uh, um, on the job with mentoring. Registered apprenticeships also include um, rewards for skill gain. And so um, this would be specified within the contract and um, is explicit so that both the apprentice um, and the company understand what skills need to be achieved um, and the related rewards for that in terms of increased wages. And then finally, registered apprenticeships um, result in a national occupational credential. Um, as an apprentice uh, itself, but then also we'll be talking about other industry-recognized credentials as part of the model that we've proposed. So, um, you know, I think we've recognized this as um, a, an effective model, which is why the sector partnerships that are involved chose to pursue this opportunity. Um, I think it's also widely recognized as a best practice across the country, which is why the Department of Labor and the administration are putting such an emphasis on it. Um, you know, the fact that it's employer-driven um, is, you know, critically important, but also the fact that individuals are able to learn while they earn is an important aspect of the model. Apprenticeships are really good for business, and so you can see some of the many benefits to manufacturers listed on your screen. Uh, you know, it, I think these are um, proven benefits, and uh, we're hopeful through this project that many more manufacturers through our, throughout our region are able to experience these benefits. The American Apprenticeship Initiative is um, the name of the award um, that was given to the Greater OPEN Network. Um, and uh, there are actually 46 awardees across the country. Um, for our particular award, what we said that we would do is to address specific skills gaps by increasing manufacturing apprenticeships. Um, we'll do this in a number of ways, which we'll get into in more detail in just a minute but providing um, additional support, incentives, 
outreach and education to manufacturers to make it feel more accessible and more doable um, is really kind of at the heart of our model. Um, we also are going to be um, offering targeted recruitment um, to workers from specific demographics, and we'll talk about those targeted populations also in a moment, and then increase education providers' capacity to provide more agile and responsive related technical instruction, that classroom uh, instruction that we just mentioned is part of, um, part of every apprenticeship. I thought this was interesting. We participated in the grantee uh, webinar with Department of Labor, and they gave us just a little bit of feedback about the grantees um, as uh, they're broken down across the country. So as I mentioned, there are 46 grantees across the country. You can see here that um, information technology and advanced manufacturing were among the highest number of awards. But still, if you think about uh, the fact that there were only 46 to begin with, and there is a pretty good array um, across sectors, we know um, just from uh, the networks that we have that there were quite a number of manufacturing-related um, proposals. And so um, I feel um, you know, really thankful that we were among those um, to be able to be awarded um, one of the um, few advanced manufacturing awards. So this is really, um, you know, I think probably one of the most important slides because it gives you a sense of um, the specific gaps and barriers that we set out to address within our um, uh, within our apprenticeship grant proposal, and then the solutions that we proposed. So you know, as we thought about this and, and worked with um, our manufacturers and partners to explore, you know, the question of you know, if apprenticeships are, are, you know, so beneficial, why is there such a low level of adoption, particularly among small and medium-sized manufacturers? And so as we talked about that uh, with manufacturers, both who have uh, adopted apprenticeships and those who have not yet, these were some of the gaps and barriers that we identified. So first, um, I think manufacturers are a bit uncertain about the return on investment. Um, you know, there, it, it does take um, an investment and a commitment, um, and we've heard from those who are involved that there certainly is um, benefit and return, which is why they're doing it, and they are willing to help us to spread the word. But I think in order to address this, we'll need to do several things, and so that takes you over to the innovation solution, innovative solutions um, column there. So through this grant project, we'll develop a, an ROI model and then um, related outreach materials and messages to help us to get the word out to other manufacturers about the significant return on investment. We also have included within the budget employer reimbursements to encourage manufacturer participation and to offset the costs involved, particularly as related to the um, classroom training portion. And then finally, we know that um, it's most effective for manufacturers to talk to manufacturers about their experience, and so we'll be facilitating a peer-to-peer -peer outreach approach. The second gap um, or barrier that we identified was that um, there's a perception out there that the current process to start an apprenticeship program is very involved or daunting. And so um, particularly for small and medium-sized manufacturers, um, we heard from them that if there were a group-sponsored platform or a multi-employer platform that would help to facilitate the process, that that would um, ease the burden and um, increase the chances of participation. And so that's exactly what we'll set out to do. Um, I think you know many of us are familiar with um, what some of the unions, for example, have done with their apprenticeship programs. So in this case, um, instead of the um, you know electrical uh, union serving as the group sponsor, um, in this case the Mahoning Valley Manufacturers Coalition will serve as the sponsor um, to recruit and screen applicants, to register um, the apprenticeship model itself, to develop joint curricula, all on behalf of a group of manufacturers who are all interested in the same occupational um, focus for an apprenticeship, so hopefully easing that burden and making it um, easier to participate. 
We also hear um, from time to time that apprenticeship programs are perceived as long programs with rigid requirements. And so um, the other thing about the model that we've proposed and we'll be pursuing is that instead of it being time-based, um, we're looking at a competency-based model. And so this allows greater flexibility. It also acknowledges um, individuals who may come into the program with some level of competencies already, and so they should not have to repeat coursework. Very similar to some of the career pathways work we've done with some of the sector partnerships already to acknowledge um, that previous skill and experience. We would want to do the same thing here, and therefore, um, in some cases, being able to compress the timeline for the apprenticeship as well. We heard that um, many times uh, individuals lack the basic and soft skills that, um, and that prevents them from entering into manufacturing career pathways. Um, this is true of individuals who want to enter um, directly into employment or who want to get advanced training, and in this case, um, for those who want to enter directly into apprenticeships. And so our solution there is a pre-apprenticeship program that will leverage partner resources. Um, there are pockets of activity around um, this idea of manufacturing readiness or pre-apprenticeship already throughout the greater Oaken region, and we'll talk about that again here in a minute, but that's going to be an important part of our model as well. We um, have heard that there are low levels of participation in apprenticeship programs from targeted populations, um, and you'll see some of those targeted populations under the solutions comment uh, column. So, you know, here we have um, identified and um, will be targeting veterans um, and transitioning service members, the low-skilled population, women and minorities, and transitioning foster children. And so we'll be um, organizing targeted recruitment efforts, a grassroots approach using community-based organizations and other networks of partners that are on this um, session today and others that we'll be reaching out to in order to um, outreach to these populations and hopefully attract and recruit them into the pipeline. And lastly, um, we heard from those who are offering apprenticeships that the related technical instruction, that classroom um, training component, um, that those offerings, while um, of a good quality, were um, many times provided um, sporadically and also at times and places that weren't necessarily conducive to the apprentices themselves. Um, so it's difficult to get a critical mass to have um, an in-person uh, cohort. And so um, our solution to that is to offer modularized and flexible um, classroom training um, offerings throughout the region with content also that's better aligned to manufacturers' needs and industry credentials. So we will be working with education and training providers on that solution. So just a reminder of the footprint that we'll be using um, for this grant project. Um, this is uh, involving two states, as the greater O10 region would suggest. Um, there are five workforce boards, and you'll see those listed. So um, if you're looking at the map, uh, the Northwest Pennsylvania Workforce Board is in blue and covers six counties. Um, the uh, West Central Job Partnership is in the reddish color and uh, involves Lawrence and Mercer counties. You'll see um, what's known as the Gap, or Geauga, Ashtabula, and Portage in green, Trumbull in yellow, and then um, the Mahoning and Columbiana Training Association, or MCTA, in orange. So we cover 14 counties and um, uh, a number of sector partnerships as well. And this really drove um, the selection of that map. So you can see here that we have five sector partnerships that are involved in this effort. Um, the first is the Mahoning Valley Manufacturers Coalition um, that involves three counties that are listed there on your screen. Um, we also have the industry partners of Lawrence and Mercer counties, and together those two groups have been working um, together collaboratively under the OPEN Manufacturing Collaborative umbrella over the past several years um, and have been supported by another Department of Labor grant um, through the Workforce Innovation Fund that has allowed um, some of the foundational work that was um, you know, important when laying out the career pathway for this grant proposal. We also have the Northwest Pennsylvania Industry Partners, or the Advanced Diversified um, Manufacturing Partnership, 
Um, and that group has been working in the apprenticeship space over the past couple of years, and I think we can learn from some of the work and experience that they have undertaken, so we're excited um, to bring them into the mix. As well as the Erie Regional Manufacturer Partnership, um, focused primarily in Erie County at the moment, um, this group is replicating the MVMC model um, and involves 20 very committed um, founding member companies and um, they're very interested in apprenticeships as a core focus of their work. And then finally, the Portage County Manufacturers Coalition, which also replicated the MVMC model, um, located in Portage primarily, um, but also will serve, I think, as the hub to bring in Ashtabula and Geauga counties as well. We had many, many um, partners, uh, many of you on the phone who signed on to the grant um, project. And so in addition to the sector partnerships, we're very fortunate to have both state apprenticeship councils and the related state agencies who are very supportive. Um, we've al already reached out to both states' um, apprenticeship leadership who are very supportive of this. Um, they're starting to, and I think had a relationship um, prior to this, but starting to talk to each other across state lines and um, are very interested in working closely with us as we develop this model. We've had great support from the local workforce boards, um, the Career Link, and the Ohio Means Jobs offices, um, and the state agencies as well. Um, many of the education and training providers, many of you again on the line, um, some of you have been um, working with apprenticeship programs for a long time. Others are you know, taking the opportunity to learn more about it, and we'll um, look forward to working hand in hand with you um, as we look at some of these competency-based models and some of the implications on the related technical instruction. The Adult Basic Literacy and Education, or sometimes known as ABLE partners, um, came to the table right away. Um, some of them on uh, just a little bit of information uh, you know, and were willing to sign on, but uh, we're grateful for that. And they'll play an important role, I believe, in the pre-apprenticeship program in bringing um, individuals up to speed on their basic skills, and so we've had some uh, preliminary conversations with several. Um, we've got strong relationships in some parts of the geography, and we're looking forward to creating additional relationships with others. Community-based organizations also are going to be important to us in providing wraparound services uh, to those pre-apprenticeship participants. Um, as well as some of that grassroots outreach that I mentioned earlier. And the same is true um, for the United Ways. Um, we had, uh, again, several letters of commitment um, from United Way. I think that they um, largely, from county to county, are interested in learning more about our work and um, more supportive of the initial concept. And then finally, economic development and other business services uh, organizations who will help us to get the word out to um, additional manufacturers about the benefits of um, apprentices and bringing more to the table. We have state and national partners who signed on as well. Um, NIMS, as an example, um, the National Institute of Metalworking, um, the National Tooling and Machining Association, which is very active in Northwest Pennsylvania and has um, done some of the work with the industry partners up there in um, some of their uh, apprenticeship models. The Manufacturing Institute, which is the nonprofit arm of the National Association of Manufacturing, and um, several others, including a lot of the um, National Manufacturing Innovation Institutes in lightweighting, digital manufacturing, um, additive uh, in the case of America Makes, and then other um, business and manufacturer organizations, um, all of which are committed in informing content and also in distributing information out to their members and interested manufacturers about what we're doing and how they can be involved. So our goals. Um, as I said, our overarching goal is really to increase um, the uh, ability of manufacturers to meet their needs for highly skilled employees um, by increasing their use of registered apprenticeships. We also want to make sure that we're streamlining um, the process for uh, recruiting and assessing and pre-screening candidates um, and providing on-ramps to those career pathways, specifically in this case to apprenticeships. And then, um, finally, to increase representation of those targeted populations that I mentioned earlier. 
We have several stated goals. So these are the metrics that uh, DOL will be looking for us to achieve. Um, the first is that we uh, need to uh, create 300 new apprentices um, and have those registered by uh, year five of the project. And so you can see that we've allowed some ramp up time. In this first year, what we envision is that those 25 apprentices, I mean, I think we said maybe across eight or eight or so companies, um, although that number can vary. We envision that these will be our early adopters or even companies who already have apprenticeship programs, but who will be willing to work with us to help um, you know, look at that return on investment model, um, share some of the benefits that they've experienced so that they can be the commercial, if you will, um, to other manufacturers and to the peer, their peers throughout the greater OPEN region about um, the benefits of using apprenticeships. The other thing um, that we'll be focused on is um, showing an increase of systemic support for registered apprenticeships, so system-wide support. It can come um, in many forms, and so there are a couple um, listed here. So in addition to uh, manufacturers' commitments to program expansion beyond the life of this grant, you know, we hope that we can prove the model here and bring some resources to the table to incent their participation, but by um, participating that they will um, you know, see the benefits of uh, participating in a long-term basis. But also um, in other ways, such as um, ongoing workforce board commitments to fund pre-apprenticeship programs and apprenticeship programs themselves, as well as um, other funding that's available that we can leverage in support of apprenticeship programs. So as I said, we participated in a grantee orientation with the Department of Labor a couple of weeks ago. And um, this was their slide to us. And so I thought I would share it with all of you as partners in this project. Um, so you know, first of all, they're looking for us to do what we said we would do, which I think is a reasonable expectation. Um, but they want to make sure that we meet the goals um, and the things that we um, included within our statement of work. And so they're looking really for us and us collectively with the other 45 grant recipients to create a new ecosystem that supports apprenticeships and integrates registered apprenticeships as an important tool and practice um, as they look to transform the workforce system and, um, you know, again, that ecosystem that includes the education and training providers and others uh, who are important to this work. They want us to implement the registered programs and register apprentices, of course, um, align systems in support of registered apprenticeship, and sustain those partnerships to drive future expansion. So, um, you know, we've got five years to set this up and get it rolling, um, but really uh, we need to start now thinking about what that looks like after the, the grant dollars go away um, and uh, planning for that. They want us to ramp up quickly and effectively. Um, obviously, they want to see results soon. Um, they want us to make sure that we're reporting on a timely um, fashion and that we're monitoring progress. So um, how are we going to use the funding? Um, always a question of interest. So um, as you may recall, the grant award was for $2.99 million um, over a five-year period. We um, earmarked a significant portion of our budget to support apprenticeship training costs. Um, we thought that this was going to be important to bring additional manufacturers to the table to allow them to you know, test and try out this new model, and also to incent those who are willing to work with us, even if they already have apprenticeships, um, to offset their costs um, in meeting with us and helping us to learn from uh, what they already have in place. That said, we also thought that it was important to incent those early adopters. And so you can see that um, we have included uh, more resources in the earlier years. Um, in the, so we're looking at $6,000 per apprentice in year one, and that waning to 2,000 in year five. The hope would be at that point we um, should be identifying additional existing resources to help offset the cost, and so that's our eye towards sustainability, um, and again, also just looking to incent those early years. 
Um, we'll be talking in a moment about the governance structure, but it's probably worth mentioning here that um, you know, kind of the, the terms of engagement um, for these resources are yet to be defined. So we need to um, put some parameters about how these dollars are used, when they're awarded, and so forth. But um, it, you know, in the broad brush strokes, at least, these are the resources that will be available to manufacturers to offset their costs. And we'll have some of those early details ironed out, um, hopefully just after the first of the year. We also included within the budget um, some resources to help with the group sponsorship model design. Um, this is going to include convening groups of manufacturers to um, prioritize their occupational focus, um, and then also to work with um, providers and partners to figure out a process for getting the word out and recruiting and screening individuals uh, to feed into that group sponsored model. Um, there will also be some administration of the group sponsorship and so forth, and that will be supported with um, this funding. We'll be creating um, tools and resources to help manufacturers, um, not just, just to get the word out, but also um, to convince them of the benefits. Um, this will include developing that return on investment model and collecting um, the data to support it from our regional manufacturers. We'll be building on the toolkit that's available already through the Department of Labor and customizing it to our region. And then we'll be spending time um, providing technical assistance um, to our education and training providers um, for related technical instruction improvements and coordination. Um, so we want to make sure that we have that readily available to manufacturers who are adopting the program. And then finally, um, it, there will be resources to provide some uh, liaisons. Uh, their function will be to liaison with the state offices, with manufacturers directly, and through partners to leverage relationships that already exist within the community. So those are kind of the high points of the grant funding. Um, 2.99 seems like a lot of money, but in the grant writing process, we realized very quickly over five years, um, you know, it wasn't going to benefit any one partner or even the manufacturers um, in, uh, you know, in large part. But I think that was by design because this is about um, improving systems in support of apprenticeships and not necessarily infusing the systems with so much money that um, when the money goes away, then the, the apprenticeships do too. So we'll be trying to work smartly and invest those money in um, providing the capacity building and technical assistance that will be important, especially within the launch. So I mentioned governor, governance structure. So let's talk about that for a moment. Um, in the grant, they, they asked us for um, thoughts about how we would be making decisions and guiding and shaping um, the grant project as we move forward. And so um, we outlined three main points of governance. So the first is the advisory council. So this would be a body that would be made up exclusively of manufacturers. Um, and so they would be responsible for ensuring that the project remains demand driven. That's really you know, a critical tenant of um, the work that we've been doing in these sector partnerships. And so we want to make sure that um, manufacturers remain at the helm and that they'll provide guidance and industry expertise. But recognizing that we, uh, this project will only be successful um, if we have other voices um, who are important to designing and improving the model. And that's where the steering committee comes in. They'll oversee the implementation of the project um, and specifically focus on the development and improvement of various aspects of the model. So um, we know that many of you have been um, testing things out and um, are interested in innovating along with us. So we'll meet those voices at the steering committee level. And then finally, um, we will organize two action teams. Um, we're calling them work-based learning action teams. Um, but essentially, this would be the table where anyone who is interested in implementing um, or being involved in this model and this project will be able to come. Um, we'll focus on building and strengthening the relationships among the partners involved. Um, but also, this will be our feedback loop to figure out, you know, as we're testing things, um, you know, what's working and what's not working. And so um, we envision that one of these action teams will be situated uh, in the um, original kind of OPEN region, uh, Mahoning, Trimble, Columbiana, 
Mercer Lawrence and um, others who are kind of attracted to that geography. And then another will be situated more in the kind of northern tier of things. And so we'll work with um, that group to figure out what's the right geography and um, the right uh, venue and, and method um, of we're envisioning in-person meetings and then probably also some virtual, um, depending upon the pleasure of the group. But um, we want to talk a little bit about the composition of these um, of these various points of governance. And um, we're going to ask you to put your thinking caps on. And um, this will be you know, the first next step in the way that you can be involved. So um, the advisory council, as I said, is made up entirely of manufacturers. And um, the way that we have set it up, or that we explained it within the proposal, is that we would have two manufacturing representatives from each one of the five sector partnerships that I mentioned earlier. So we'll be communicating directly with each one of those sector partnerships in um, the next week or so, and asking them to identify their two representatives from each of those sector partnerships um, so that we can look to convene those um, that body as soon as possible, um, as soon as schedules will allow with the holidays and so forth, um, as they'll have some you know, critical policy decisions to make um, fairly quickly. The other body, the steering committee, um, we described as having um, not only members of the advisory council, but then adding to it a representative from each one of these key stakeholder groups that we have listed on your screen. So this is where we need your help. Um, we are interested in um, representing the entire geography and representing all of the voices um, within uh, the, the geography and within each one of these stakeholders. Um, but we know that uh, you know there's not an existing mechanism to kind of nominate or vote on <laughs> uh, representatives from each one of these stakeholder groups. So um, we've been talking internally and work with the workforce board leadership, and thought what well, the best way to approach this would be to describe it to you all today, um, ask you to give it some thought. If you're interested in perhaps um, serving on the steering committee. Um, I'd ask that you um, let us know that within the next week or so. Um, I'll give you Sue Watson's contact information at the end of this webinar, but she would be the person that you would contact to express interest. And then um, we'll take a look at that, uh, compare it with geography um, and you know total representation, and see you know how closely we come to it kind of naturally working out. And otherwise, we may get back to a, if there are more people who are um, interested than uh, have available spots, then we'll get back to you and figure out maybe some sort of rotation or something that's equitable. So that will be one of our areas of focus, uh, both of uh, situating and um, organizing both of those bodies within uh, the coming weeks. And then the Work-Based Learning Action Team. Um, we'll be getting word out to everyone um, about those meetings, uh, at least those initial meetings. And I anticipate that those will happen in um, probably mid to late January or early fe February, as we'll want to convene the council and the steering committee first. OK, so a few other um, roles that I thought might be helpful to cover here, um, and so that you know kind of who's who um, and who uh, kind of stepped up and are um, kind of integral to the grant project. So first of all, the West Central Job Partnership, who I mentioned earlier, uh, this organization is the Workforce Board in Mercer and Lawrence counties. They are serving as the fiscal agent. Um, this is an important role. They are um, conduit to the Department of Labor. Um, they'll be coordinating with the national evaluator. Um, they will be providing all of the grant reporting. Um, but also we'll be coordinating with all of the local workforce boards um, and the American Job Centers, which are essentially the PA career links at the um, Ohio Means Job Centers. Um, and uh, we're very grateful to them uh, in serving in this role. They were the fiscal agent also for the Department of Labor Workforce Innovation Fund that came to the five-county area um, that's just wrapping up and has been active for the past three years. And so that's helpful because they kind of know the ins and outs. They know what Department of Labor is looking for and um, become a, a bit of a, a 
refined oil machine. So um, Eric Permacy will be serving as the project manager. Uh, many of you probably know Eric. Um, he uh, does a great job in this role, and we're really happy to have him in that, in that position. The Mahoning Valley Manufacturers Coalition, so they are serving as um, the, uh, for the lead business organization. Um, the way that the grant was laid out was that we needed to identify both a public and a private um, lead partner. And so we have West Central and the Mahoning Valley Manufacturers Coalition serving in those roles. Um, what this means is that MVMC will um, be the of organization of record for the group sponsor uh, group sponsored registered apprenticeships, um, but also they'll be leading um, overall coordination, uh, coordinating the peer to peer outreach, uh, coordinating referrals, uh, both for from interested companies and also interested potential apprentices. Um, that said, they will be working extremely closely with all of the other sector partnerships as the mechanism to get information out to the wider group of partners and to get information back in. So um, while they're serving as the lead, it's going to be important that each one of those sector partnerships remain engaged and uh, leverage the work that they're already doing within their um, sub-geographies of the Greater OPEN Network. Thomas T. Miller & Associates. Um, is uh, the organization that I work for. Um, and so, um, and again, if you didn't hear at the intro at the beginning or joined us late, this is Jessica Borza. Um, we also have others on the team who will be providing sector partnership coordination and outreach to manufacturers, uh, manufacturers about apprenticeships. So essentially, we staff uh, the Mahoney Valley Manufacturers Coalition and um, will be serving in the role of um, coordinating the advisory council, the steering committees, um, developing collateral materials, um, coordinating with all of uh, you who are providing that related technical instruction, um, developing that model, and then um, serving as apprenticeship coordinators to um, liaison with the state apprenticeship staff, um, conduct presentations, uh, coordinate that peer-to-peer -peer outreach and so forth. I wanted to spend just a minute today, and certainly there'll be future conversations about this um, as it's an important part of the model, um, but I did want to spend just a minute talking about the pre-apprenticeship component. So um, we did describe the pre-apprenticeship component as being based on some of the work um, that had been developed under the OPEN Workforce Innovation Fund grant. Um, their manufacturing readiness program uh, was based on best practices and evidence that included pre-apprenticeship programs. Even um, three years ago, they had their eye on, on this as um, you know, a potential um, piece that needed focus. And um, so this model would prepare individuals um, not only to uh, enter into an apprenticeship, but also to enter into um, direct employment, into a semi-skilled manufacturing position, um, or to gain the skills that they need, the kind of basic skills and entry-level skills, to enter into more advanced manufacturing skill training. So this could be classroom training, or as it is the focus here, into apprenticeships. In this model, as it stands now, um, they earn seven credentials in seven weeks, um, including OSHA 10, the National Career Readiness Certificate, which is the work keys um, credential of basic skills, math, locating information, and MSSB's Certified Production Technician, which is a validation of skills such as safety, knowledge of manufacturing processes, and so forth. As the uh, pre-apprenticeship component is contemplated now, um, we'd be looking at leveraging graded funding. So the funding that originally supported the development of the program through the OPEC Workforce Innovation Fund um, in Ohio, uh, they've got a pilot grant, um, and so uh, that will be funding two cohorts through the end of June and can be used as leveraged funds to support this effort. Um, we also have commitments, as I mentioned earlier, from uh, the EBLE providers to support um, contextualized remediation, so kind of brush up math and reading using manufacturing examples. 
And then our workforce boards also committed to support one cohort in each of the workforce areas um, for each of the five years within the grant. And so uh, we very much appreciate that, and that will allow us um, to support this component of the work and leverage those existing resources. And then we know that there are many other related um, activities um, and efforts going on and other sources. And so uh, we know as an example that um, Jake at the Area Regional Chamber um, is leading some conversations about you know, outreach, recruitment, screening, preparation, and what that kind of pipeline and funnel looks like. Um, we know that the Workforce Innovation Fund grant project in Northwest Pennsylvania, um, it has an interest or a component in this kind of readiness, you know, developing a pool of um, workers that are ready for entry-level manufacturing jobs. And so we want to make sure that we are acknowledging those conversations, bringing them together, and um, you know, building on what's already in existence. So there'll be many more conversations about this, uh, presumably at the action team level. Just wanted to acknowledge that, uh, acknowledge those efforts and let you know at least our initial thinking about that. Okay, so um, just to kind of round out our time together before we get into questions and answers, um, let me talk just for a moment about next steps. So um, first of all, I think most importantly, um, we are going to be focused on solidifying the governance structures that I described. So if you are interested in serving on the steering committee, if you fall into one of those stakeholder groups, here is Sue Watson's contact information. Um, I just ask that you shoot her an email and let her know of your interest. Um, and if you could do that within the next week or so, then as I said, we'll be looking to sort that out. We'll be in contact with you um, to, uh, to you know, figure that out from here. We'll also be in touch with, with each one of the sector partnerships to solidify um, their two um, members that will represent them on the advisory committee, or council, rather. Um, we'll also be focused on initial outreach. And I maybe should have said this at the beginning, but our approach has been um, the, the grant was officially awarded on October 1st, although um, I think we heard from Department of Labor and just had our initial grantee uh, uh, grantee orientation just a couple of weeks ago. So um, but what we really wanted to focus on this first quarter, October, November, and December, on getting some preliminary information out there. So that is, um, this is probably the most important step in that process is uh, reaching out to all of you and, and providing you with, um, you know, this information. And um, then we also wanted to get information out on the website, and um, we'll continue to put um, preliminary information out so that um, as people hear about this and are interested, that they can um, get that information and also know who to contact um, for further information or to express interest. Um, so we'll be looking first to um, identify early adopter manufacturers. Um, so if you are a manufacturer who is already doing apprenticeships or has a strong interest in adopting apprenticeships or even just learning more about them to know if it's a fit for you or not, um, I would urge you to contact Diane Carlin. I'm going to just flip to the next screen for a moment just to show Diane's information, which you'll see at the top right of your screen. Um, Diane is going to be leading the employer engagement component of this project. Um, and so um, I would suggest that she um, will be the best kind of central point of contact. She also, um, that said, will be um, reaching out and has already begun to reach out to other business serving organizations and networks. Um, the Business Resource Network will be reaching out through the chambers, through economic development organizations. Um, so if any of you who are serving businesses know of those that um, are interested or would be interested in being part of that early adopter group, please let Diane know so that we can include them in our plan. We'll certainly also be um, providing or you know, um, putting out large calls for um, interest and putting more information out, but it's good to know um, in these early days who may be interested. We have begun to put information about uh, this grant and apprenticeships in general on a website called Industry Needs You. Um, you'll see the URL there. Um, this is a site that was created originally uh, by the industry partnership in Mercer and Lawrence counties um, when uh, 
Mahoney Valley Manufacturers Coalition joined forces with that industry partnership. They quickly realized that it was a strong brand and a solid foundation. Um, that group then used some of the Department of Labor uh, Workforce Innovation Fund resources to bolster uh, that website. And so it's got a lot of information about manufacturing career pathways um, and I think is general enough and certainly not geography specific um, to serve as a clearinghouse for information about this project. Um, and it's paid for, so <laughs> we can leverage that as a resource. So you can take a look at that. Um, we will also be adding information and reaching out to the other sector partnerships to add their brands um, to that site. And so that's another point of focus for um, the coming month or two to make sure that they're strongly represented. And then finally, um, we'd ask you to help us by cross-promoting um, Industry Needs You, that page on Facebook and other social media. And so we'll get that out to you and you can take a look. We know many of you have strong followings and um, so you can help us as we promote apprenticeships um, on Facebook and LinkedIn and other social media. And then finally, maybe not finally, but at least the final thing that I'll highlight in terms of our next step um, is beginning to um, develop the model. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we've been in touch already with both of the state agencies. Um, we will follow up with them and start to put outlines uh, together as far as what that um, shared governance model looks like and um, you know, uh, make sure that it meets all of the requirements and needs for both states and um, eases access for the manufacturers that are involved. The last thing that I um, want to mention before we um, answer some of the questions that you shared um, throughout the course of the webinar is just some contact information for our project team. So you'll see um, uh, the names of the team on the screen. Um, again, I'm serving as kind of the overall project lead. Sarah Hunt, who may, many of you may have interviewed, um, is uh, kind of our resident expert in career pathways. And so we'll be focused on that model and some of the related technical instructions. Um, Sue Watson is our project coordinator, and so will be kind of the glue for all of us um, and our you know, central point of contact for much of the communication. Also a reminder, she's the one you can contact if you're interested in serving on the steering committee. I mentioned um, Diane Carlin, who will be our point of contact or lead for employer engagement. Um, Danielle Hosey is leading um, the pre-apprenticeship work and has been working with manufacturing readiness. And Jessica Driscoll is our lead for outreach and communication. So um, she's already sent a news release out about the grant. Um, she's updated the website. We'll continue to provide that um, support and leadership for outreach and communication. So um, that's the information that we wanted to share with you today. Um, I do have several questions that have come in through the chat room um, and would encourage you to add additional ones as they come up. Um, the first question is um, asking about uh, if participants will receive a copy of this webinar. Um, we certainly are happy to provide the slides and can do that to you so we can follow up with an email to each of you to provide um, the PowerPoint slides. And as I said, it also will be available at the website that I mentioned earlier, industry needs you slash apprenticeship. So feel free to um, share that with um, folks who couldn't participate or for your future reference. We have a question um, about candidate screening. And the question is, um, who will screen applicants? And this was um, specifically for the Erie Regional Manufacturer Partnership. Um, and uh, that came in from uh, Barbara Shafee. Uh, Barb, thanks for the question. Um, it, I think that's yet to be determined. Uh, we want to make sure that we're leveraging existing partners and building on their strengths. Um, so in my mind, I think that you know there are some logical partners that could help to contribute to that, uh, like the Career Link as an example. Um, but that's who we'll be looking to are, are those partners who are already showing some um, strength and capability in that space who would be willing to um, you know, customize a process um, in response to the needs of manufacturers and of this program. Um, but again, we're trying to build this with sustainability in mind. Um, so we're hoping that we'll be able to engage some of those types of partners um, and certainly many others within the community to recruit, um, to recruit applicants into the pipeline. But those are initial thoughts. 
that's something that will be shaped along the way and something that the action team will be uh, responsible for helping to, um, to contribute to. Um, okay, so the next question is, what staff will be involved in apprenticeship recruitment? Okay, so I started to touch upon this a little bit already. Um, here again, you know, we're, we're really looking at leveraging um, all of you in the recruitment effort, um, but we will have um, staff who will be providing more of a coordination role. So these will be individuals who will, um, you know, be reaching out to um, organizations like the United Way to get out to uh, the organizations that they fund and have networks with. Um, we know that there are many other community-based organizations um, who are doing great work and would have natural networks um, to reach into the communities and help with recruitment. And so um, we at TPMA at, in our coordination role will be helping to coordinate that. But in terms of staff, there you know we'll be looking to leverage some partners um, in doing that as well. Okay. Next question is, um, if a company is interested in enrolling in uh, the apprenticeship initiative, who should they contact? Um, and again, I'll go back to Diane Carlin. So um, at this point, Diane, again, will be the central point of contact. And so you can see her information there on the screen. And it's not too early, even though we don't have the process you know, completely ironed out. Um, I think, as I said, the um, initial meeting of the um, council in um, you know late this year will be important and so I think by January we'll be ready to roll um, and uh, we'd like to at least have a sense of interest so that we can be working with those companies pretty closely and understanding um, even at a minimum we want to make sure that we understand their occupational focus. By the way um, we did have Stu Watson led the efforts of um, coordinating and collecting all of the letters of commitment during the grant writing process, um, which was a huge undertaking, but um, we really had our manufacturers step up and commit. And so while um, we know that our minimum number of slots is 300, I think our um, commitments um, exceeded that by, by a, a, a fair amount. And so um, we'll be looking back to those manufacturers who committed in that process as well. But, um, you know, the occupational focus um, of these initial adopters will really drive our efforts and, and our focus of that related technical instruction as well. Okay, so the next question, these are great questions. Um, the next question is, will employers have a minimum wage requirement to participate? Um, so the way that um, registered apprenticeships work is that you do need to state um, the uh, wage gains within the contract. Um, and so we will need to um, we will need to specify that um, it is something that we've talked about as you know one of those things, especially in the group sponsored model, that we'll have to work through. And so we, um, as an example, can state a minimum wage, um, and then individual companies who participate in that group sponsored model. Um, can exceed that wage if they want to, so that's one possible scenario. Um, but that would be the kind of thing that the council will be discussing as well. Um, I didn't say, and I probably should just clarify, while we're focused on developing the group-sponsored approach as an innovation within, within this grant project, we also will be supporting companies who are interested in developing their own individual apprenticeship programs. So if that's your preference as a company, then you're certainly um, uh, able to do that and we'll support you in that way as well. Um, so we've got, you know, options for companies in the way that they want to uh, want to approach it. Okay. When is funding available to begin apprenticeships? Um, so, yeah, as I said, I, um, I'd like to know if you have plans to start an apprenticeship Soon, um, you know, let us know because we don't want to miss um, those opportunities. I would say um, after the first of the year is what we're targeting, um, but we want to know as soon as possible if you are interested in um, beginning an apprenticeship so that we can support you in doing so. Um, there was a question about the NIMS competency-based um, apprenticeship model. 
we um, that is the model that uh, we specified within our grant proposal. NIMS is a supporter and will be providing technical assistance to us, and so there will be kind of more opportunity to elaborate on what that model is and um, how it works uh, in the future. Uh, in future conversations, we don't really have time today, but as the model and as our plans progress, certainly that will be a focus. All right, um, there's a question about the steering committee. Um, this is an important one. How frequently do you see the steering committee meeting? Um, do they need to be committed for all five years? So we've talked about this. Um, I think initially the steering committee may meet more frequently. Um, I would say at most once a month in the first maybe six months. Um, and then I imagine it would be more of a quarterly basis. I say that, but really that will be one of the initial questions for the steering committee itself. Um, so they'll determine that uh, the right uh, level of communication and uh, the frequency of their meeting schedule. Um, we also talked about you know, the fact that um, it is a five-year grant and we have lots of stakeholders who um, we expect will want to be involved. So it's possible that um, we put together some sort of a rotating schedule um, per term, so to speak. And so that's a possibility, um, and that would help us to err on the side of being inclusive um, and also not wearing you guys out with a five-year term. So um, I think that's definitely a possibility and something you can um, consider as you think about whether or not you might want to be involved. You know, if you, we would love to have you if you're willing to commit even to a, uh, just a year or two. Um, Next question is, do companies need to be members of the industry partnerships to participate? Um, so we certainly would like to see um, members of the sector partnerships who supported this effort um, participate and benefit and adopt this as a way to meet their skill needs. Um, but um, we haven't stated that as a requirement. Um, we will, that will be a question that we will pose to the council in their first meeting as well as part of the guidelines um, to tap into and use those incentive dollars though. So I don't want to, um, I don't want to rule that out, but I would say um, we will be supporting um, companies across the region regardless of whether they are in a sector partnership or not. If they want technical um, assistance, our goal is to increase the number of registered apprenticeships within manufacturing facilities um, across the greater Oakland region. And so um, we'll support them in whatever way that we, uh, any way that we can. Um, and let me see, anything else? Looks like we're um, running short on time. So maybe just one more question, and that is, is the grant funding model strictly for new hires um, or do they pertain to a current employer? Oh, very, very important question. So um, the grant funding is not strictly for new hires. Um, we do have some goals of um, percentages of new hires that we'd like to see participate, but um, the majority of funding actually is earmarked for employees to upskill, or employers, I should say, to upskill their current employees. So if you have employees who show promise who you think would make a great journey person, um, then we would um, certainly support that with the grant funding. And the hope would be that then you'd be able to backfill with a, an entry level person um, or you know, just upskill um, and create those internal career pathways. So uh, great question. Um, and yes, that money is available for new hires or existing employees. Great question. Thank you guys so much. Um, well, I'm Sorry, I feel like, well, I did talk this the whole time, <laughs> but um, I appreciate um, the great questions, um, and I'm really excited to begin this journey with all of you, and um, I look forward to having opportunities to meet um, and actually have a, a, a better dialogue and a more in-person format. Um, so we'll look forward to um, hearing from you about your interest in serving in those various capacities. And we'll be in touch with more information. Uh, and I think things will really get rolling um, again after the first of the year. So um, get ready. And um, please feel free to contact us in the meantime with your suggestions and questions. Um, that's what we're here for. So again, we appreciate your time this morning. Um, thank you very much. And everybody have a great day.